All right, everybody. Hey, we are back, 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 back from our short little break there. And uh, I am honored and excited. Like I know many of you guys are going to be excited to listen to this next hour 15 session we've got with the uh, 1031 legend, somebody who is, I would say, the nation's foremost expert on 1031 tax exchanges. And what you often hear, because when people always ask, hey, can I do a 1031 exchange with this property to a note? That's not necessarily the case. Can't usually do it that way. But Dave's got some workarounds. He's going to talk about some of these things, how powerful they are, commercial, what they are, and some things you can leverage with this. So uh, without further ado, join us from the nice, sunny St. Pete, Florida, our buddy Dave Foster. What's going on, Dave? Hey, nothing much. It's great to be here with you guys today. Sounds like I'm on the tail end of what's been an awesome weekend. Well, you are not the last speaker today. We got another one after you, but it's uh, what we have a very, very loyal listener base who's actually rocking and really, really loving what everybody's providing out. And I know when I uh, sent out surveys beforehand, this was a, a top two, top three topic for everybody they want to learn more about. So you've got, uh, you've got a willing and able audience. <laughs> That's awesome because I'm the nerd that lives there. <laughs> not, every, not everybody admits to being a tax nerd. I I freely do. Oh, that's and, good uh, stuff. Actually, uh, you know, I had such a great time appearing on your show, you know, a few months ago. The topic of 1031 exchange and note investing is just not something that's a natural fit yeah. uh, for a lot of reasons that we're going to talk about. But one of the things that excited me today as I started to prepare for this was the idea of saying, okay, there are as many different ways to make money as there are people in the world. There's many different ways to invest in real estate as there are people in the world. It's a question of finding your wheelhouse, your niche, your sweet spot. And as I started to develop from that saying, okay, what's the confluence? What's the, what's the place where tax code and 1031 meet with these crazy people that go by debt? <laughs> and it started to hit me. It's like, Really, although it feels like it's not as closely aligned as you would think, I'll bet that if I asked everybody out there today right now, how many of you have owned real estate in the past, either a primary residence or investment real estate? And added to that, how many of you currently own real estate, either a primary residence or a piece of investment property? And how many of you plan in the future to own a piece of real estate, either a primary residence or a piece of investment property, my guess is that I would get virtually fanned by every hand that's in this room today. Yeah, that's the truth, that's the, that's the, that's the truth. Now are you want, um, I forget that you want to leave questions to the end as you're going through your presentation? Was we? Yeah, that sounds good. Why don't we do that? And then what we haven't covered, we'll come back and and absolutely come back on it exactly so oh, well, i'm gonna uh, drop off my video but i'm gonna be in the background here listening and, and, and pop in occasionally okay beautiful so with with that being said then the idea is that everybody out there is either an accidental investor a wannabe investor a current investor or an accidental investor of some sort and if, while at the same time though you specifically came to this camp this weekend to learn about note investing and how that fits into real estate. So I'm going to spend a lot of the time today early in the presentation talking about real estate specific and two parts of the tax code that speak to that and how they can help you maximize your investing portfolio by minimizing your tax burden. And then we're gonna segue into how the soon to be wannabe accidental current real estate investor can use those parts of the tax code to maximize their portfolio, minimize their tax burden, and at the same time, begin to build a very healthy income stream from investing in notes and debt. So with that being said, I introduce you to the man with the eyebrows, of all time, Justice Learned and Supreme Court Justice 1920, when Section 1031 became part of the tax code. Yes, it's been around for almost 100 years. But even back then, 
when the tax code was being instituted, the Supreme Court, the government realized at that time that taxes are not something we need to be volunteering to pay. Taxes are something that we should pay because we're supposed to, but don't pay any more than you need to. When you're talking about real estate and federal tax law, there's really two parts of the code that speak to it. So we're gonna be shaping our discussion today around primary residences, which are found in section 121. We're gonna be talking about investment real estate, which is found in section 1031. And then we're gonna bring in the third aspect, which I'm just generally kind of calling intangible. It's real estate that's not exactly real estate, but yet it allows you to invest in the real estate sector. And notes and debt are exactly that type of thing. But to get the discussion started so we can frame it, section 121 deals with your primary residence, the property that you live in. If you have a piece of property that you live in and you have owned it, lived in it for two out of the five years prior to selling it, then you can sell that property, take the, up to $250,000 in profit. If you're married, that doubles to $500,000. So you get to take the first $500,000 in profit tax-free. And you can do that once every two years. Now, let's think about that, review that. It's your primary residence. It's tax-free. You can take the money that you make off of that and do anything you want to with it. And you can do it once every two years. Now, an obvious confluence in note investing, if you're an accidental investor or you're an investor who happens to only own your primary residence, would be that every two years, you could sell the property that you live in and take that cash and do two things. First, because it's all tax-free, you're getting to use 100% of the money. So take some of that money and go buy another primary residence while you take the rest of that money and invest that into some other type of real estate portfolio, whether hard real estate, or at that time, if transition is what you're wanting to do, then transition some of those dollars into note investing. You'll have been able to do that without paying any tax. And the beautiful thing about it again is that you can do that once every two years. Now, I think I read a study several times and it's, it ranges within a year or so, but that basically the average American buys and stays in their house for around four to five years. Which means that even if you did nothing other than your normal pattern of living, once every five years, you would be able to sell a property and take $500,000 in profit without paying tax on it and shift the use of that money into anything else that you want. Talk about a source of revenue for a war chest or to start a portfolio of notes. Now, again, primary residence only, tax-free, once every two years. Now, the other part of the tax code that deals with taxation on real estate is where I live most of the time because it's where people have to use my services. And that is in section 1031, the 1031 exchange. It deals with investment real estate and it is tax deferred. Here's the way the tax code reads exactly. And there's a bunch of virus yada yada in there, but basically with the 1031 exchange, when you are selling business or investment real estate, you get to defer the payment of the tax that is normally due on sale. <clears throat> now that's not quite as sweet as tax free, it's tax deferred, but I wanna emphasize that it is tax for deferred indefinitely until some other trigger happens. And you can do this not once every two years, but at any time 
when you as a people, when you have a piece of property that you've held for business or investment use. So it's not as good as tax free, but you can do it more often and it involves any of your investment real estate. So primary residence tax free, investment real estate tax deferred. The way that you can source the money on your primary residence, if you wanted to invest in debt or notes, is pretty obvious. With the 1031, we have to manipulate some things within the process, but that's the trailer teaser for why you're gonna stay with me for the next several minutes. So why would an investor even think of using a 1031 anyways? Well, let's take an example that is kind of cool. We're gonna start with two investors. They're each gonna have the same property. They're each gonna generate the exact same gain, same appreciation, and they're always gonna leverage that new property at 20% down as high as they can. The only difference is gonna be that investor A, as you see, is not going to pay tax on his gain. He's going to use that gain so that in the case of this first sale, he's gonna be able to buy a property for $500,000, while over he's, on the other side, he still owes $20,000 in tax. Now, investor B, makes the same game, but they're gonna pay the tax. So they only have $80,000, which they can use to buy a $400,000 property. And that's the setup for the rest of their career. When they sell in year five, investor A once again does the 1031 exchange. They sell appreciated real estate, and then they use the proceeds, in this case, $238,000, to purchase a property with 1.2 million. They owe a bunch of tax. Investor B doesn't owe any tax, but they're only able to buy a property worth around $850,000. Year 10, following the exact same pattern, it, they really start to separate, don't they? And finally, by the time year 20 comes around, after a good long investing career, when you look at it, investor A owes a bunch of tax. I mean, a half a million dollars that they haven't paid. Investor B doesn't owe anything. But look at what investor A is able to control. Simply because they've used that $500,000 in tax to leverage their own portfolio instead of paying the tax to the government so the government could use it as it deems fit. This is really nothing more than a simple exercise in compound interest. What you can do if that tax dollar gets to benefit you versus benefiting the government. So for all of you who either own investment real estate, have owned investment real estate, or hope to own investment real estate, the 1031 exchange is going to be a powerful, powerful, ally to you, but we've got to find some ways to make it work into some other types of investing. And that's what this section is going to be about. There are six basic requirements that all have to be met in order for a 1031 exchange to be valid. There's a requirement on what type of property qualifies. There's a couple timing rules that have to be met. There is a requirement to use a certain person called the qualified intermediary. There's a requirement so that title must be held. And then lastly, there's a requirement on how much you have to reinvest. All six of these must be met in order to have a valid 1031 exchange. If you fail on any one of them, then your entire exchange will fail. So with that, we're gonna dive into this very first one. What is it that qualifies for 1031 treatment? It is actual real estate. Now, I'm gonna make a real clear distinction. Real estate is deeded hard asset real estate that's been held for investment, trade, business, or for investment. It does not qualify 
for notes. Although someone says, well, wait a minute, I'm buying a mortgage. And when I have a real piece of real estate, I have a mortgage on that real estate. That is correct. But owning the mortgage is not the same as owning the real estate. Owning a REIT, which is a real estate investment trust, is owning a piece of a company that owns real estate. It's not owning the real estate itself. So non-starter one, you can't sell a piece of real estate and go buy some mortgage notes because that would not qualify. So, but once we've got that out of the way, let's see what kind of real estate would qualify. Real estate that you've held for your trade could be a shoe factory that you have if you're a shoe manufacturer. It could be a storefront firm, a uh, storefront you have your restaurant in. You're holding it for use in your trade. That real estate would qualify for 1031. Real estate you hold as a business is basically rental real estate when you think about it. I have a shopping center, I rent the units out. I have single family homes, I rent them to tenants. I'm using actual real estate as my method of business. I'm a landlord. Or real estate that is owned for investment. I buy property now, and again, here's another distinction. Not because I'm gonna fix it and flip it, because there my intent is to immediately resell. But if my intent is to hold for productive use and I buy a property now that I'm going to hold because it's gonna be worth more later, then I'm buying that for appreciation. I'm buying that for investment. So how I use the property is the key, not the type of property. Any kind of property, that you hold for income or use to produce income can be exchanged for any other type of investment or income producing property. Real estate only, not personal property, not interests in securities, so actual deeded real estate. And interestingly enough though, the definition of real estate is determined by the individual states. How, why do we know that? Well, it's because, let's take a look at probably the, the easiest example that's out there in all 50 states. If I own a mobile home, is that real estate or is that an RV, a mobile home, personal property? <clears throat> the answer lies in where do I get my tax bill from? If I get a registration certificate from the DMV of the state it's in, that's not real estate, is it? It's personal property. So then it would not qualify for 1031 treatment. But if every year I get a tax bill from the property appraiser's office for that mobile home that's mounted on cement blocks on a lot somewhere, then it's real estate. So depending on how the state treats what you own, it could be real estate or it could be personal property. Uh, in all 50 states, oil, gas, and mineral resource rights are considered to be real estate, including, royal, including royalty programs. So I could have a lease on, a real, on an oil well or a royalty interest in a bunch of wells in Ohio, and that is 1031-able real estate. In Florida, we got some funny things that are really a big rectangle of water that you pull your boat into, a slip at a marina. But many times those slips have been condoed out so that each slip has an individual owner, and that owner gets a tax bill for that slip. Well, that hole in the water is an actual piece of real estate that could be 1031 for a vacation condo, a multifamily apartment complex, whatever real estate you would want to, and it could be done tax deferred 
under section, section 1031. By the way, we call those documentiums. Yes, of course. Now, I mentioned the hold period because your intent, I'll say it again, your intent must be to hold the real estate for productive use. If you're simply buying a piece of property because you're gonna fix it and then resell it, you are what we commonly call a fix and flipper. Your intent is not to hold the property, but it's primarily to resell it, and it would not qualify for 1031 treatment. So there is no statutory holding period, but in general, the longer you hold it, the better you're going to be able to demonstrate your intent. <clears throat> and of course, a couple of quirks with section 1031, as a US citizen and taxpayer, you can only use 1031 to exchange US property for US property and a couple territories, Guam, the US Virgin Islands, and the Marianas Islands qualify for 1031. Someone is going to ask, can I sell in the United States and buy in Puerto Rico? The answer is no. And the follow-up question though is why, Dave? And the answer is I really don't have a clue. It has to do with the way the original treaty is read for when Puerto Rico became a U.S. territory and commonwealth as opposed to the U.S. VI or Guam. Uh, but U.S. property for U.S. property or foreign property for foreign property. So let's talk about what types will qualify. In general, rental property is always going to be an investment. Why? Because it's property that's not my primary residence. I make money renting it. And as a landlord, my intent is to hold on to that property. I contrast that with raw land, which is always an investment. Although raw land generally does not make income. So your the length of time that you hold property is not the bellwether criteria, nor is income production the bellwether criteria that determines whether the property qualifies for 1031. So it's any real estate that you own that you hold with an intent of using for productive use. And as long as that's your intent, it's 1031-able. Here's a great example that brings in even another type of real estate. Bill and Jane want to sell a duplex. Well, that's rental property. They want to buy a condo that they're gonna use some themselves. Would that qualify? And the answer is absolutely, because the code does not specify that you may not use it at all. They put some limits on how much you could use it if you want to be able to deduct expenses and mortgage interest and those kind of things. But as long as your intent is to hold it for productive use and look at what they want to do, they want to rent it out. So on their tax form, the 1040, they're gonna be showing income and expenses every year, aren't they? Their intent is to hold it for productive use that absolutely would qualify for a 1031 exchange. So it's any kind of real estate for any other kind of real estate, as long as you're holding it for investment intent, you wanna make sure to know that it must be actual real estate. So as of now, you still can't invest in notes, but stay with me. The next one crime requirement is a 45 day identification rule. You have 45 days with day one of the day of closing the sale of your property. You wanna think about the 1031 exchange process starting with the closing of your sale. So day one is the day of closing. During that 45 day period, you're going to identify re potential replacement property or properties. It has you during that period, you can either purchase and accept ownership of your replacements. A lot of our clients will have a property already under contract and they'll close their sale, two days later close their purchase and their 1031 is done. 
But during that 40, so during that 45 day period, you can close anytime you want, or you provide a written list of your potential replacement properties. Now, at the end of day 45, that list cannot be changed anymore. So it is a very serious process that you want to be careful. It's got to be in writing. It's got to be specific identification. You can't just identify a unit in one building. You would have to identify a specific unit in that building. Now, as long as there, there's a couple quirky things. As long as you name three or fewer properties on your 45 day list, it doesn't matter what they're worth. So you could sell a property for $100,000 and name three $5 million replacements. That's perfectly fine. But as soon as you want to name more than three properties on your potential list, then the total value of those properties cannot be more than 200% of the value of what you sold. So sell a property for $100,000, want to name four properties on your list, it's okay as long as their total is no more than $200,000 unless you purchase 95% of the list. Now right here, I realize I just took y'all into deep weeds. And I'm sure there'll be some follow-up questions about this, but let me also steer you to a video series that we have on our education portal, which is the1031investor.com. There's a whole series of articles and videos on this exact topic. The IRS is really interested in keeping a lid on you and managing the amount of information. So they've created sort of a funnel. And if all you name are three potential properties, they're fine with anything. But if you want to name four or more, you've got to pay attention to how much they're valued for unless you're going to purchase all of them. But for further, for further reference, check out the website or let's circle back at the end for some questions. Here's the key. There's no exceptions and there's no extensions. If you come to day 45 and you don't have any properties on the list or you forgot to turn in a written list, your exchange is done. If you put properties on your 45 day list and you got outbid for one and one of them burned down and the other one was in a hurricane, it doesn't matter. Those are the properties that you can choose from. So the 45 days is serious business. So let's take us back to the three levels of identification. Bill and Jay want it sold, they want to identify three. Can they do that? Sure. Because as long as you identify three or fewer, it doesn't matter what they're worth. They sell for that hundred thousand, they want to identify four potential replacements. Condos sell for 75 each. Can they do that? Well, four condos at 75,000 is $300,000 in replacement real estate. The 200% rule would say that my total list can't be more than $200,000. So my list limits are 200,000. I wanna name 300,000 in potential replacements. So right off the bat, you're all saying, well, no, that's not okay, but it might be if what? if you actually ended up purchasing 95% of that $300,000 value of the list. So in order to do that, you could, but you would have to purchase all four of those condos. So obviously you can see it's not the easiest thing in the world to do, but the 45 days in my mind is what separates the men from the boys, the girls from their toys, it's the serious rule. It's the one that trips up more investors than anything else. Now, concurrent with that is the 180 day rule, which again, starts with day one of the closing of your sale. You have 180 days to complete your purchase of the replacement property or properties. 
and the purchase has to be one or more of the properties on your 45 day list. Obviously, if you close on that property during your 45 days, that simply becomes your list by default. Again, no exceptions, no extensions. But 180 days always feels a lot better than 45. So I did just steer people back to that and say, if you can make things happen in the 45 days, you're gonna be in great shape to finish closing it off. Uh, but of course, because the IRS is who they are, they always have to add one little thing as a gotcha. And that is that you don't really have 180 days. You have either 180 days or the day that you have to file your next tax return, whichever comes first. The reason for this is that there is no penalty for starting a 1031 exchange and not finishing it. People get worried. If I try this, am I gonna get in trouble if it doesn't go right? The answer is no, because this part of the rule guarantees that your exchange will be done prior to your next tax return. So if you start an exchange and it blows up, you simply don't report it on your next tax return. You pay the tax on the profit, you go on down the road. But if you complete your 1031 exchange satisfactorily, then your accountant is going to file the form 8824, which reports the non-recognition of gain and the 1031. So it's not that they just wanted to be a problem for us. They want this rule here so that whether your 1031 succeeds or not, you're never gonna be penalized and you're never gonna to have to refile a tax return. So as you can see in parentheses up there, the easy answer to make sure you always get 180 days is to file an extension if you need to. The people that do 1031 exchanges are called qualified intermediaries and you cannot do a 1031 exchange without them. They're required by the IRS to document your exchange, to manage the processing of the proceeds from your sale to your purchase. You cannot touch the money, and there are some specific requirements of what has to be placed on the settlement statements for closing. And they must be an unrelated third party. So the QI has a very particular role in that all they're doing is the 1031 exchange. You still use every one of your normal professionals, your regular accountant, your regular lender, your regular attorney, your regular realtor, your regular title company. They're all the same. The QI is simply an added piece to the puzzle that's gonna be the person in charge of the 1031 exchange. And here's the key. Because you can't have either constructive or actual receipt of the money, and because documentation must be on both the settlement statement of the sale and the purchase, the QI has to be involved at or prior to the closing of the sale. I still get a call maybe once a month from someone who tells me they've just sold their property and they now want to do a 1031 exchange. They can't do it because for two reasons. First of all, there's no 1031 documentation that's on the settlement statement of that sale. But secondly, and even more importantly, there's money that's in their account that says they touched it. And even if they told their title company, hang on to the money, because I'm going to do a 1031, because it's not a QI, because there's not the documentation, that title company will give you your money back at any time. So even though you don't have actual receipt, 
You have what the IRS calls constructive receipt. You have control of the money. And that disqualifies you from doing a 1031. So no joke, got to use QI and they have to be in place prior to the closing of your sale. Title requirements simply refers to the fact that the taxpayer for the old property has to be the taxpayer for the new property. Now, usually that's going to mean who's on deed. But I use the word taxpayer very deliberately because taxpayer actually means whoever is reporting the taxes for that piece of property. So it could be an LLC that you own or a partnership that you have that actually has title, or a, I'm sorry, an LLC that has title to the property, but the LLC may not file its own tax return. Instead, the tax return that reports the property is your personal 1040. Well, in that event, you're the taxpayer, not the LLC. So you've got to dig to find out who has title and who's reporting the taxes for that property. You may be a corporation or an LLC that owns a piece of property and you might be a member of that LLC, but you cannot do the 1031. The LLC must do the 1031 because it's the tax return of that LLC that reports the property. So you've got to dig a little deeper to find out who the actual taxpayer is. Hey, we just went backwards there. The last requirement is that in order to defer all tax, you must purchase at least as much as you sell and all of the cash proceeds must be reinvested. So at the end of your closing, the check that would normally go to you and instead goes into your exchange account must all be used in the next purchase or purchases. Now, let's think about notes for a minute. We haven't mentioned them for a while, but that keeps you, doesn't it, from pulling money out to go reinvest in notes. Okay, we're gonna find some ways that we can work around that. But in general, if you want to defer all tax, you need to reinvest all cash proceeds. Secondly, you must purchase property or properties that's at least equal to or greater in value than what you sold. It's a two part rule and you must meet both parts. Now, you could purchase less than you want. You could take cash out, but when you do that, the IRS says you're taking boot or profit, you pay tax on the difference. Now, here's another way of thinking of that. The amount of cash that you have at the end plus whatever mortgage was paid off equals your reinvestment goal. Or if you want to think about this as a settlement statement, the net sales price of your property, which is what? Contract price minus closing costs and commissions equals your net sales price. So it's either the net sales price or cash plus debt relief or your reinvestment target. It's going to be the exact same number either way. Just depends whichever way you like to think about it. Now, before we review the basics, let's talk about doing a partial exchange. We said that you had to do these two things in order to defer all tax. But if you don't mind paying some tax, you can do what is called a partial exchange. Just understand that the first dollar you pull out, the IRS says is going to be a dollar of profit. You don't get to pull out your original capital or your down payment first. So it could be the same $10,000, but either way, the IRS says it's profit. You say it's original capital. They've got nuclear weapons. You don't. Tell me when's the argument. So property that qualifies for 1031 treatment is property that's held for investment. That's 1031. Remember all the way back at the beginning 
that section 121 deals with your primary residence. It's tax free. 1031 is tax deferred. It's property held for investment. You've got 45 days to identify your potential replacements. You have 180 days to complete the entire transaction. People like me that do these things are called the qualified intermediary. You have to use us and we have to be in place prior to the closing of the sale. The requirement that the taxpayer be the same on each property is what we call our titling requirements. And in order to defer all tax, you must purchase equal or up, at least as much as you sell. If you meet all six of these criteria, then you will successfully have sold your highly appreciated or highly depreciated piece of investment real estate, and you will have indefinitely deferred the payment of tax into that new property. And remember, compound interest is your friend. The longer that you can hold off paying the tax, the longer you get to use the money to make for yourself. So different ways to use 1031 exchanges when you're dealing with real real estate. You could consolidate, which is taking several smaller pieces of real estate and purchasing one larger piece of real estate or selling $400,000 properties that are single family and purchasing one large multifamily where all the doors are consolidated, I guess it's a great word. Why not? Easier to manage, easier to scale, better NOI, all those things. But you can sell a number of properties, purchase fewer. You could also go the opposite direction which is to sell a property, and instead of buying another property for that same price, go buy two properties for 50% of that. Many times we recognize that when we buy a property, like let's say it's a little garden variety, $100,000 single family rental, and it's all of a sudden in a few years worth $200,000. Well, a $100,000 property might generate $1,000 in rent, but a $200,000 property might only rent for $1,500. So rather than sell that property for $200,000 and go buy a $200,000 property where your ROI is gonna suffer, use the proceeds to diversify and purchase two $100,000 properties. The other thing that plays into that many times is that if I like to do value add and I'm a rehabber, not a fixer flipper, but a rehabber, then I may know exactly what it takes to buy a $100,000 property and fix it up really nice to maximize its value. The type of flooring, the type of countertops, types of cabinets, all those things. But I may not be as comfortable making the choices that turn a $200,000 property into a $400,000 property. So again, why not sell and diversify back into the types and sizes of properties that I'm comfortable with? The kind of fun thing about 1031 is you can diversify, 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 sell one, buy two, sell one, buy two, sell one, buy two until one day you realize that you've got a pretty extreme need to consolidate. And that's the ebb and flow of 1031 investing throughout your career, is you're expanding your portfolio, you're shrinking your portfolio, whatever it is that's gonna best meet your needs. Minimizing tax. Of course, we realize that in the back of our minds, but designing the 1031 exchange is specifically to minimize the tax and put it 
at your disposal. So as much as you can craft exchanges to keep tax at a minimum, and the reason why I brought this in at this point was because we mentioned earlier that it is possible to pay some tax and take money out periodically. But you always want to gauge that against the power of leaving all of that tax in the deal and using it for your personal portfolio. So in the case of a partial exchange, many times our clients are better off completing a full exchange and then refinancing the new property afterwards. So the 1031 is a design to add properties, subtract properties, diversify and minimize tax as you're going. You can also maximize the investment yield. I just wanted a pretty picture that had a graph on it. Uh, but isn't that some interesting stuff in talking about house price changing? Pretty crazy. Um, but what you could use is to change both sector and your return on investment. Like we talked about from single family properties that may have a higher NOI or a lower NOI, I'm sorry, to multifamily properties that might give you a higher NOI per door. You're maximizing your yield so that you make the greatest amount of money per dollar of investment, including the dollar of deferred tax. It's a big deal. Market inefficiencies happen all the time. And in today's small world, where you could be with sitting with Scott in Austin, or in New Hampshire, or on the beach of Laguna, California, listening to this, we're finding that it is so much easier to see where there are efficient inefficiencies in real estate markets. California has had a phenomenal run of appreciation in the last few years. But generating good ROI on cash flow is becoming more and more increasingly difficult, causing investors to look at places where cash flow is much better or where there is hidden areas where there's pent up demand, such as places in Tennessee where there are some wildfires a few years ago that destroyed a lot of the investment properties. Market inefficiencies, region by region, can allow you to use 1031 exchanges and increase your yield greatly. Planning for retirement. Remember the 1031 is going to let you defer tax indefinitely. As long as you continue to own the real estate that you 1031 into, you will never have to pay the tax. Or unless you do another test, as long as you own it, or as long as anytime you sell it, you do a 1031 exchange. So you can shape your portfolio from active management, preparing for retirement, to get into something more like passive management. And another thing that we're gonna think about and we're gonna come back to it is one of the greatest of passive managed investments might just be investing in notes. So finding a way to transition from investing in hard 1031 real estate into passive 1031 real estate and couple that with investing in notes is gonna be pretty key. And I think we'll have some fun with that in just a second. But the last shoe to drop in retirement is knowing that if you pass away while you own investment real estate, your heirs will inherit that real estate at what is called a stepped up basis, which means the tax disappears on the day you die. So all of that deferred tax 
that you worked hard to never have to pay and to use for your own benefit. When you die, it disappears for your heirs. What a legacy to be able to give to your children and grandchildren because then they get to start over with a clean slate. So there is a whole lot of motivation to continue to defer tax as long as you can live. But how can I do that and end up being a note dealer at the same time? Well, some of the things that we like about notes, first of all, it's in the real estate industry. So you're gonna spend a lot of time evaluating a note the same way you would a piece of real estate because the value of that note is certainly in the borrower and it's certainly in the terms, but it's backed by a very real piece of real estate. So those of you, remember, who are accidental investors, who are property owners, who are wannabe owners, you're hardwired with a love of real estate. And so moving into note investing is a very, very natural move if you could do it. One of the other pros that I like about investing in notes is that it's passive income. So like I just said, I love the idea of being able to transition into note investing as a replacement or supplement to my 1031 real estate investing. I just want to be able to do it without having to pay the tax because that's the whole point of 1031 investing. Investing in notes is transportable. Well, again, with a computer and a Starbucks, I can do it from anywhere, can't I? And it's scalable. I can build it as big as I want. I can keep it as small as I want. But what's the problem? Well, first of all, it's not compatible with the tax deferral in 121 or 1031. You can't use those two processes. Those are reserved for real real estate. Now, there's going to be a confluence of them, and that's where we want to live and talk about. But if you want to get the tax-free dollars of the primary residence exemption in 121, you've got to buy a property, move into it, and live in it. If you want to get the tax deferral under Section 1031, you have to own investment real estate, sell it, do the process, and buy new 1031 real estate. The second and biggest con of dealing with notes is that there's really minimal tax benefits. One of the beauties about investing in real estate is that you get to deduct all of your expenses of ownership against your income. You get to depreciate the property, which is an imaginary tax write-off, but the IRS gives you every year. Now, if you just sell your property, you have to pay that back. Bummer, but if you do a 1031 exchange, you do not have to pay tax on the gain, nor do you have to depreciate, the real, recapture the depreciation on the real estate. So you, in theory, get to take that depreciation tax write off for all 27 or 39 years it's available and then die and have it go away. So that transition from active to passive also allows you to continue to defer repayment of the depreciation right off. With dealing in notes, you don't get many of those benefits. So where does all this come into play? I just kind of sat down and was talking with my clients who do these and said, what are some ways that we can combine myself as a real estate hard asset investor and become a real estate note portfolio investor? Well, the first thing you do is what I say, delay the inevitable. Hang on at 1031 as many times as you can until you finally 
Just sell the property, pay the tax. There's this really cool numbers game called the rule of 72. And the rule of 72 says that if you take 72 and divide it by the interest rate you think you'll receive, the number you get is the amount of years it will take for your investment to double. So if I have a, a piece of uh, real estate money that I'm going to invest and make 10%, the rule of 72 says that 72 divided by 10 means that my money will double in 7.2 years. So what if all you did was to 1031 two or three times, making 10% on your money until finally, after seven to 10 years, you sold it. You have made enough money on the money that you did not pay in tax to actually pay the tax you owe, which is the same as selling that first property tax-free. So pay the tax with the tax by delaying it as long as you can. And then finally, go invest in notes to your heart's content. Another option might be that there's a whole world out there of fractional note investing. Uh, places like Ground Floor and some others where you can actually source and buy fractional pieces of notes. So rather than sell your investment in real estate and pay the tax, why not take the cash flow from your investment in real estate and use that to scale your note portfolio? Buying fractionally at first and then slowly adding to that, letting it scale naturally because the motivation is that I want to continue to defer tax as much as I can. Now, uh, you've probably heard this time and time again, but the whole idea of using self-directed IRA and retirement vehicles to invest in things like real estate and notes, in particular, I love to see notes and lending inside retirement vehicles. Why is that? because of the minimal tax breaks that you get from investing in notes, they're perfect to use in a vehicle where tax breaks don't matter. But the tax breaks outside of your real estate investment, of your retirement accounts are huge. They impact scaling your portfolio, but they also vary really impact your annual tax burden. So I would always say, if you can structure it, invest in notes inside retirement, keep investing in real estate outside of your retirement to gain the maximum value of those massive um, tax write-offs that are there. Turn your real estate portfolio into your note portfolio. How can I do that? Well, we've kind of talked about that, paying the tax with the tax, cashing out, or, but there's two other methods. The first one involves your primary residence. Remember when you sell a primary residence that you've lived in for two years, you're gonna get that money tax free. And that's when you can take a chunk of that every two years and go buy some notes. And then you start to turn those notes over. And every two years, you're selling another primary residence. What does it take to do that? First and foremost, a very happy, willing spouse. Make sure that you're buying and living in your primary residences so that the time to sell them is not just when it's time to buy another note. The greatest piece of wisdom I ever heard was from a real estate broker down in St. Pete Beach who had three 
retirement properties that he was going to move into and turn into his primary residence and live in and then sell one each time. And he said that the criteria for when he was going to sell was that whenever it was time to redecorate, he would just sell. So every two to five years, you have an opportunity, don't you? To take a bunch of tax-free dollars and turn that into a piece of your note portfolio. But in addition to that, we talked about doing partial exchanges on the investment side versus doing a full exchange and refinancing. What if you did 1031 exchanges, kept deferring tax, but then did a refinance of that property and took the proceeds and then invested in notes? What are you accomplishing? Well, you've got tax deferral completely. You've got tax benefits from your real estate portfolio. You've got double of the sources of income because you've got income from the notes and you've got income from your real estate. And who's paying the mortgages all the way around? Your tenants or the buyer? I feel like I should break into a, a Louis Armstrong version of what a wonderful world. Because where else do you get to create something that's going to benefit you personally, both in terms of cash flow and in terms of tax write-offs, and the burden of it lies solely on the government, the tenant, and the buyer. Wonderful, wonderful. You can use installment sales to create and build up your own portfolio. And with that, I mean, instead of selling a property and doing a 1031 exchange and deferring the tax, instead of selling the property and not doing a 1031 exchange and paying the tax immediately, you could sell the property and use an installment sale. Sell to that buyer and carry back your own mortgage. That's one way of creating your own note. And the thing that I really liked about this when my panel was telling me about it was that by doing that, you're creating a note on probably the most perfect piece of collateral you ever could because it's a property you've already owned and you know intimately. So you're going to pay the tax, but you're going to pay the tax only as it comes in. Your risk for default and foreclosure is that you get a property back that you already used to own. So you know what to do with it. And yet at the same time, you've created a note for your portfolio. I'm going to take the personal blame for creating the burp method of investing. Uh, there's some folks out there that talk about the burp. Buy, rehab, rent it, and real estate. Took me a few minutes to find a way to uh, add the U and the P. And it stands for underwrite the paper. Buy, rehab, rent, and underwrite the paper. Underwrite the note in your 1031. That's another form of doing a cash out refinance. And then using the cash out money to go buy notes on the open market. And if you could make a disgusting sound, like you just had too many tacos, do it right now. And then remember that, that you've got the ability to 1031 exchange, completely defer all tax, do a refinance, have your tenant pay the mortgage and take the tax-free refinance proceeds and turn that into a cash flow interest producing note for yourself. What a beautiful deal. 121 investors uh, that selling your primary residence, that's tax-free dollars like we talked about. And using the installment sales, just re-emphasizing that. Those are all ultimate ways to transition into that. But I like to think of it as kind of 
three lengths of investing. There's the primary residence, which you can do with your, where you live in, it's tax free, and it's once every two years. There's the 1031 investor, which is hard assets, but it's investment real estate only, and it's deferred indefinitely. And then those are ways that we can make those combine in a wonderful world to create opportunities for you to invest in intangible real estate assets like notes. That's the nutshell of it right there. Hope you enjoyed it. Scott, do we have any questions out there right now? We got a few questions, but you said the burp method. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> I got on my sound machine. I've not used that button in a while, but there's a reason to use it today. We will never forget that ever, will we? <laughs> no. All right. So we've got quite a few questions, which is good. We do we'd have this. So we'll start first. Let's see here. Uh, uh, Todd asked the question, what happens if you have more equity proceeds than the Section 121 limits? Oh, well, then I would say a couple things. First of all, you've got a really nice problem, don't you, Todd? So the answer is, yeah, what can I do? If my primary residence sale is going to exceed the $500,000, you got a couple options. First one would be you'll shelter 500, pay tax on the rest. But yeah, we can do better than that. If you have the ability to move out of that property and turn that property into investment for a year or so, then what have you done? You've taken a section 121 property and you've turned it into a section 1031 property. So after a year, you could sell that property and do a 1031 exchange on it and defer 100% of the tax. But it gets even better because what we would do in a situation like that, Todd, is that we would give you $500,000 in boot. Remember that taxable on a partial exchange? So normally, if you do a 1031 exchange, you'd have to pay tax on that 500,000. But did you live in that property for two out of the five years prior to sale? Yes, you did. So you also qualify for the primary residence exemption. So what you're going to do is move out of the house, turn it into investment, sell it, and do take five hundred thousand tax free, and do a ten thirty one exchange and shelter the rest of the tax. Give yourself a hand, because that is an absolutely splendid strategy. Mm -hmm. Sure is there. That's a good one. Um, what's the, what is the holding period for a property before it can qualify for a 1031 exchange? Oh, uh, that's a great question. The answer is there isn't one. There is no statutory holding period. What there is, the standard is your intent. So if your intent was to hold the property for productive use, it qualifies. If your intent was primarily to resell it, it does not. Now, that being said, longer is probably better than shorter. A lot of people feel very comfortable at anything more than a year. The reason for that is not because it's in the statute. The reason is because and anything more than a year, a couple things happen. First of all, you the property moves into capital gains, which feels longer term. Secondly, anything more than a year always means that the property is going to show up on two consecutive tax returns, which fulfills a court case from a long time ago where it talked about two tax returns. So while a full year isn't anywhere in the statute, those are some of the reasons why people feel more comfortable. But as long as your intent 
was to have held it. Did it get disqualified? Here's a great example of that. Uh, a property that you bought, you fixed it up, it's tall to the max, and you put a for rent sign on it, and you're trying to rent it. And a, a new doctor comes to town and says, well, I want to live there. It's beautiful. Will you sell it to me for a ridiculously absurd price? And of course, you'd be crazy not to, right? It's a deal you can't refuse. So you sell that. What was your intent? Your intent was to hold it for productive use. But along came an unsolicited offer. So you changed your intent. So I'm not giving you a real fixed answer. I'm kind of just telling you it really does come down to what your intent is and how you can demonstrate that. But mark my words, a fortunate accident where you buy a property and end up selling it quickly, that that might happen once in a while and be no problem at all. But when the same accident happens six or seven times a year, there may be something else going on. And one thing the IRS is not is lax about checking into that. Good answer there. Um, all right, so I got a couple questions here. Marlene Green, I think you might have missed something. If you, do, if you defer until you die, what happens after you die? The state pays the taxes or the heirs pay, uh, pay the, net, the, the taxes? Oh, that's the beautiful thing. And by the way, it's, it's the 4D, it's the 4Ds of life. Defer, 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 die. Because <laughs> nobody pays that tax. Property that is in the estate is given a step up in basis. So let's say it was a property you bought for $200,000 and it was depreciated out to basically zero. And it's now worth a million dollars. When you die, if you sold it the day before you died, you'd have to pay tax on a million dollars. But when you die, it goes into your estate and the executor values that as if your heirs paid a million dollars for it. So the estate doesn't pay the tax and the heirs get it as if they paid a million dollars for it. So the tax truly just does disappear. Ooh, would that be the 50? Defer, 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 die and the tax disappears. <laughs> Dissolves. We're, dis dis we're in fuego. <laughs> so let's see here, Marlene asks, so if a property, if properties are titled in land trust on public record, but on personal or LLC tax return, you have to quit claim deed them out of trust before doing the 1031 to meet the title criteria of number six? Yeah, you know, every accountant is going to have a different preference on that. Strictly from the 1031 perspective, we honestly truly don't care who is on the deed because the deed itself does not determine the taxpayer. In the situation that you're talking about, the taxpayer is yourself or the LLC because the trust does not file its own tax return. Mm -hmm. So if the trust is owned by the LLC or the trust is owned by yourself, it's either gonna be the LLC or yourself, that's the taxpayer. So we're never gonna have a preference as long as when the next purchase happens, the taxpayer is still yourself, no matter how it's deeded. But a lot of accounts we work with will have a preference one way or the other. And they will want to match up the deed as closely as possible, either before or after. So some of them might say, I'd rather quit claim it into the individual's name before the 1031. Well, if they do that, then the settlement state seller is the individual. The settlement state seller is gonna be the buyer. A different accountant might say, I'd rather do the exchange in whatever name it's in 
and purchase in whatever name I can. Now, the land trust may not be able to purchase on its own, but in that case, the land trust would sell and the LLC or the individual would buy. But in both events though, we're not changing the real taxpayer, are we? It's still you as the individual. So that's a long way of saying for 1031, it doesn't matter so much. It's whatever your accountant's preference is gonna be. That makes sense. Uh, good question. Um, isn't it better to do a full exchange than do a cash out refi sort of paying the tax, assuming the cash flow is compared? Well, yeah, I think what the question they're asking is, am I better off to sell the property, pay the tax and invest in notes or whatever versus do a full exchange and then do a refinance and pull money out? Mm -hmm. Is that kind of the question? I think so. Right. Well, I guess a couple of thoughts come to mind. I'm not sure there is a better or not. Um, obviously, I would prefer to not pay the tax myself. So refi is a better idea. But when you refi, you don't get a refi 100% usually. So you are leaving some equity in the game. So you don't get the full advantage of the equity, but you also don't have to pay the tax. So that kind of may be a wash. Uh, the other side of that is that if you simply sell and then don't do the 1031, you get the cash after the taxes, but that's all you got. And you may be able to invest that for a higher ROI, but if you do a refi, the tenant is actually paying that mortgage. So in one sense, the ROI on cash flow on a cash refi to real estate, when you do something else with it, the return becomes infinity. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, one man's uh, one man's trash is another's treasure. <laughs> I don't think there's a bad way to go, really. No, no. Uh, question, a uh, better question. Who audits the criteria number six is met? Does the IRS care? On the reinvestment requirements? Yeah. Well, there, there's this, oh my gosh, there's this crazy phrase in the accounting industry that's called GTA. And it basically stands for good till audited. Mm -hmm. So first of all, everything is passing until it's audited. The question you're asking is what's going to happen if someone looks at the say if they don't look at any of the 1031 documentation, nothing happens. It's only going to be looked at if you're audited. But if you're audited, you've got this crazy huge paper trail that include the contracts, the settlement statements, the bank account statements from the exchange, and all of that is going to spell whether you met the reinvestment criteria or not. So as the intermediary, we're probably going to be all over you like a dog on a meaty bone, telling you that you're not quite there. Right. You're going to have a taxable event. But the bottom line is you and your accounting professionals are responsible for that if, if and when you're ever audited. So it's personal accountability until the IRS steps in, which is why if you could look in a mirror and say it without laughing, it's a much, you've got a much better chance of succeeding. <laughs> or another way of phrasing it, I always tell people, don't ever, ever, in life, do something just because you can get away with it. That's, yeah. But by the same token, don't ever not do something when it's the right thing to do, but you're worried that it might be questioned. Mm -hmm. Good advice there, Dave. Good advice. Uh, let's see here. Sherry asked a question. If one couple in community property states have 11 single family rental portfolio holding title 
under an individual land trust, uh, what is the best way to do 1031 exchange to buy a commercial rental? So they have to basically still got to sell those off, wouldn't they? Yeah, so we're selling a multiple bunch of properties. So it's a consolidation exchange. Yeah. Uh, community property is kind of a rare. But the best advice I could give you if you're in a community property state is don't divorce. So make sure the marriage stays together through that process, of course. Community property, by the way, is a state institution. So the 1031 is not gonna worry so much about that. That's gonna be at the state level if things were to ever get messy. You could consolidate a bunch of those properties if you could sell them at the same time, maybe as a portfolio to one buyer. We're starting to see that more and more frequently. Uh, but the problem is you generally take a little bit of a haircut when selling as a portfolio instead of individually. Uh, there is another process, Sherry, that we didn't talk about today, but I'll tease you with it. It's called a reverse exchange. Remember the 1031 exchange is you close the sale and then you close the purchase. But in a reverse exchange, if you found the perfect commercial property, then we could create an entity that takes title to it and holds it for you. So you don't own it, but it's controlled by you, it's used by you, and it's on hold for you until you close the sale of your 11 properties. Mm. And then you would set about closing all those. And as long as you got those closed within a 180 day period, then you would use the proceeds to take title to the commercial property. Reverse exchange is very powerful. They're complex as you can imagine and pretty expensive, but definitely doable. I don't know, can you think of any other way, Scott? No, I think you, I think you hit the nail on the head there, Dave. I think it's the best way to think about it. Uh, question here. Uh, what about properties held in a revocable living trust? Is it the same as a land trust sale? Yeah, re revocable living trusts are kind of fun animals uh, because they don't have a tax ID and they don't file a tax return. Mm -hmm. So when I have the Dave Foster Family Living Trust, I have a property that may be deeded to that trust, but that property is reported on my personal tax return. So who's the taxpayer? It's me. So the trust could sell and I'm the one who buys. And that's not changing the taxpayer. Or the trust could sell, the trust could buy. And that's not changing the taxpayer because ultimately the taxpayer is still myself. Now, let's contrast that though with a irrevocable trust. The irrevocable trust is actually a tax paying entity. And it has a taxpayer ID and it files a tax return. So it's the taxpayer. So if it sells, it has to sell, do the 1031 and buy. The beneficiaries are not the taxpayer. Mm -hmm. So it's just gotta stay consistent either way. Revocable family trust, no problem at all. Yeah. Uh, last question from Dan. Could an investor document investment intent by stating it on the purchase agreement when it is acquired? I think that's brilliant. And that's certainly one piece of it. I would always encourage people to uh, have conversations, written emails with your accounting professionals, with your realtor, talk about what you're looking for. We're trying to find a great rental property. Things like your past history, I'm typically a buy and hold investor. Things about my current business model, all those sorts of things go to paint a wonderful Bob Ross picture of you, the buy and hold long-term investor. So yeah, putting it on the uh, contract offer, absolutely. That's actually one that I've never heard. It's a good idea. Especially if you're doing loans against some properties, you're going to have investment property if it's a loan program. Say this is not going to be your primary residence. It's something 
you're starting at closing a lot of times as well. So that's, that's kind of, that's, that's helpful, but um, like what Dan said, it's not a bad idea. Uh, Dave, I want to say thank you again so much, man. Just absolutely great nuggets, great knowledge. Guys and gals, encourage you. There's Dave's phone number, his email, dave at the 1031investor.com. You're going to check out the 1031investor.com is the website. Uh, Dave, once again, thank you so much, man. Hey, my pleasure. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, great stuff, great stuff. All right, we are going to wrap, that's going to wrap it up uh, for this session. Don't go anywhere. We're only going to take like a three and a half minute break. We got Terry Garner coming on next to wrap up day two. You are going to love Terry, what she's got to share as well to you on some of the the private capital raising she's done syndications. She's also a very experienced uh, self-storage expert. But once again, Dave, thank you, bud. Have a great rest of your weekend, man. All right.